I am here with Kate Noble, the new executive director of PACE. PACE is a nonprofit organization that provides support and advocacy services for parents and caregivers in Evanston whose children have disabilities. PACE helps families navigate the special education system, which is incredibly complex to navigate. Case was founded in 2007 by Kari Levin, who stepped down last month. Today, we're going to find, more, find out more about what Case does, how you can get connected to its services and programs, and we'll also focus on two key areas. First one is how Case hopes to broaden their work with Evanston residents who historically have had far less access to services that help them maneuver through getting support in District 65 and District 202, particularly Evanston's black and brown residents. And the second focus will be what they're doing to support Evanston's families during the pandemic and with all the uncertainty of how the next academic year is going to look. So, Kate, congratulations, first of all. Congrats on your new position. Thank you very much. Before this. So I've had multiple careers. Um, I started in corporate event planning, and I left that after September 11th to join my family's real estate um, business that my grandfather built a lot of homes in Evanston and Chicago in the 50s and 60s. And so some they still owned. And after that, I helped my sister open up Bethel Shop that's in Evanston and helped her get that business off the ground. And then I decided to move into advocacy. So what brought you to Case? particularly. I grew up in Evanston and when my husband and I got married we knew that we wanted to move back and raise our family here and I was when we found out we had two children with disabilities it's very it's very scary and you feel very alone when you have children with disabilities especially if all of your friends and everyone else you know doesn't and when my oldest was two when we were looking at preschools. We found out about Case when he went to JEH for SPAC, which was the preschool special ed program at the time. And that it was just amazing to find a community within Evanston of special need parents and grandparents and caregivers who all understood the struggle and the hard work that goes into raising kids with disabilities and I just always knew I wanted to be a part because it's such a special place. So you've taken over from Kari Levin, who founded and ran the organization for 13 years. Tell us about what CASE does and what your vision is for the organization going forward. So CASE is a special education advocacy organization. So it is community-based. We serve families in District 65 and District 202. We try and limit it to that so we can really focus all of our efforts on that. Excuse me, we do a lot of um, strategy planning and we try and work with the school boards and make sure that we get special education on the agendas for different meetings. But what we do for families is we have a wide variety of services that encompass everything in special education. So we have a parent partner program where volunteers pair up with families who ask for support in meetings, for IP meetings, 504 meetings. And the parents will go with you, take the notes, and be a support person because going into those meetings alone can be really traumatizing and it can be really scary. And so just having that other person you know is on your side, it makes a huge difference. Um, and we have advocacy services. We have advocacy consult where people can call, email, ask us questions. And we also have our advocacy services where we will um, go and advocate for your child and help collaborate with the schools and work out whatever the problem is in either the child getting services, being qualified for services, and kind of navigating the entire system, which can be really tricky. 
what are the different ways families, I guess you went over a little bit of that, but like families can get involved with PACE or reach mm -hmm. out for help or meet other families who face similar challenges? So we have the parent partner program that I mentioned before, and we, in a little bit expanding on that, we also serve Spanish speaking families. So we have Spanish speaking interpreters. We have, um, we have translation services for documents, things additionally that the school maybe hasn't translated yet for a family. Um, and then we have a, um, application <laughs> on our website um, for a parent partner that is also in English and in Spanish. Um, and uh, besides that, we have the parent Facebook group, which is an amazing community of people who are always ready to offer support, referrals, they'll tell their own story. And it's just amazing. You can put any question in there and you'll get 15 responses. And it just, it's so validating to understand to when you, other people have had your experiences. And if you maybe never heard of that therapist, you never heard about that therapy. You maybe are brand new to your child's diagnosis. And now you can meet other families whose children have the same diagnosis. So it's a really unique and amazing community that's got almost 700 members in it. Yeah. Um, yeah about that group. I'm a part of that Facebook group. My son is, um, he has ADD as well. So I, I post, you know, mm -hmm. feedback from people that are in the group. And every time I've ever posted something, it's just, just like you said, very warm and welcoming, welcoming. You get, you know, a lot of advice and a mm -hmm. lot of feedback and you hear a lot of stories that are very similar to you. So yeah, I really love that Facebook group as well. Yes. Um, we, unfortunately, during the pandemic, we haven't been able to run our in-person support groups or our in-person coffee talks, but it's something that we are getting ready to roll out again virtually when the school year, school year starts, sort of based on people's availability and interest. Um, and one of the things that I was able to do last week was I held a Q&A with Romy de Cristofaro, who is the Assistant Superintendent of Student Services. And I was able to collect an um, enormous amount of questions from the community about special education, about English language learners, 504s. And she, I presented them to her. She asked, she answered them. It was recorded and is available on our Facebook page and on our website. And I have a follow-up meeting with her next week where it will be another whole set of questions. And then we'll post that one as well. Um, I think that what Case is really trying to do, especially right now, is because this deadline is looming of which pathway parents should choose. And, you know, there's a lack of logistical information out there for people. Case has just been trying to answer as many special ed related questions as we can to kind of help make that decision easier for people who might be on the fence about what their child needs in the, in the return to school. Yeah, so given the pandemic and all the anxiety parents and guardians and children are feeling about what's going to happen this year, what resources and support do you offer to families who have even more issues with their child if their child has special needs or you know even if they are lower income and can't afford private services to assist them mm -hmm. so the the district is really trying to figure out the best way to address mental health and social emotional learning in the fall and what case is trying to do is create as many a list of as many resources as we can to community programs that we partner with that are that would offer free programs and different therapies that are available um, to on all different financial levels and try and help families navigate what they feel like their child is really struggling with right now and how best to kind of triage that and get them the services that they need sooner rather than later. So if a child has become incredibly anxious and their anxiety is through the roof during the pandemic and they don't know what to do, they're afraid to go back to school, we can try and help pair them up with social workers or we can talk to their child's school social worker 
and kind of be collaborative with them to try and figure out the best way they can serve that family. But on top of that, CASE is really trying to make sure that families know that there are options. And I feel like oftentimes the school doesn't always tell family that there are options. And so we're really trying to get that list created, make it shareable, and people can be like, hi, I live close to St. Francis Hospital. Is there anything here? Or, you know, I work out in this suburb. Is there anything here? And just really try and get as much information because everybody needs the information now. Yes, absolutely. And I know you just mentioned a little bit about, you know, working with the schools to get this information accessible to parents. Um, so is there any other way that you've been, you know, trying to work with District 65 and District 202 on these issues? And how responsive have they been? So I, Case was asked to be a member of the Return to School Task Force, and I was really honored to be able to represent Case and represent special education in these conversations and in, the, in this planning. And I was really impressed with the amount of space and room that the district allowed special ed to have and to really prioritize students with special needs in returning to school. And I made sure that special ed was really a top priority of having these conversations and in planning what all of this will look like for different kids at different schools. And then for 202, they had an internal task force. Um, I don't believe community members were a part of it. And they now have some new leadership in special education at ETHS. So I'm working on trying to build some of those relationships with 202. Um, but Romy at District 65 and I have been able to really be collaborative and she's very open to hearing parents experiences, stories, and I want her to know that these families have stories. They've all experienced something different through the school closures. And I think it's really important that the district recognizes that. So District 65 has a new superintendent who's, you know, Dr. Devon Horton. He has been very vocal about his focus on racial equity in the district. How do special needs services fit into that? So this is an excellent question. And for years, CASE has strongly advocated the district to present a special education report on achievement and test score. How are special ed students doing across the district, every race, every gender, every grade? And this year, Romy did agree to present, and we were collaborative with her in trying to make sure she included specific parts in that report. And she was able to present that to the board during the shutdown in May. And that primary focus of the report was to show and address the specific problems with disproportionality and misidentification of students of color in special education. And I think that it's really important to recognize that the fact that this report was presented during a current global health crisis, but also during an educational crisis and a social crisis, it gives us an enormous opportunity to be able to address the intersectionality of race and disability in our schools and not to pretend that disabilities only affect white children or to not pretend that black children don't have disabilities and to have people understand the over-identification of students of color and the lack of resources of students of color when we're serving special education services has been a systemic issue. So I really appreciate Dr. Horton has made it a priority to talk about it, address it, and I hope we can help facilitate the conversation within the community and help spread the information so that parents feel empowered and educated to be able to make decisions for what their kids need. <coughs> Excuse me. So often black and brown families in Evanston and residents who <coughs> speak English face more barriers when trying to navigate the schools, accessing services or feeling empowered to advocate for their kids. How can you help those families? So my primary focus as being the new ED at CASE is to try and create an enormous amount of community outreach. So I plan, we plan on partnering with a whole bunch of 
community organizations, and we are going to be reaching out specifically to each of the schools themselves. I plan on reaching to each, reaching out to each of the school social workers and making sure that the information is disseminated across the district equally so that every school and families at that school know the cases here and what case does and that they can start to get the tools to be able to learn about what resources are available. And it is so disheartening when you find out families have no idea what they are able to access, no one's told them. And despite a um, barrier on economics, which is another huge one, the fact that most of them don't think they have to do this totally on their own, is it's beyond comprehension. And the fact that the district has such a big focus on equity, it seems like a perfect time to spotlight when race and disability coexist and intersect that we can really focus on building those kids up and stop leaving them behind. I know you mentioned um, that you will provide um, some Spanish speaking mm -hmm. um, materials and programming in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Okay. And, and we're always looking for volunteers. Awesome. <laughs> if anybody wants to volunteer, especially um, Spanish speakers, that would be great. And we want to be able to, another program that's coming down the pipeline is sort of a family mentoring program where we can pair up families, maybe new families and experienced special ed families and try and create those connections um, on different levels. So we could have Spanish speaking families that excuse me, can connect and try and really build community within the community. Um, so I was saying, is there anything else that you would like to say to us or, you know, make sure that parents are aware of regarding the case? I just want all families to know that case is here. We're ready. We're available. We can help from just a simple phone call all the way up to being a full advocate for you. And we also pair with the Moran Center if there are families that feel that now it's, it, they need legal representation. Um, but that we really want to be able to be all inclusive and accessible to all families in both districts and let them know that there is a place to go where they can feel welcome if they're struggling navigating the special education system. And we need to really continue to address the inequalities and inequities at school and in special education. I wanted to share um, a little bit about my personal experience with you. Um, you really wanna make a difference when it comes to you know, equity and ensuring that black children and brown children are you know, able to access the system. The schools really need to partner with you so my yes. son, who is now 13, he's going to be a freshman at ETHS next year. So his kindergarten um, year was really, really rough. He was just not getting things. And um, it, he was picking up in the, on a lot of things slower than all of the other kids. And his teachers saw it. He actually um, transferred to another classroom during that year. And at the end of the school year, the teacher pulled me to the side and said that she recommends for him to repeat kindergarten. And then I said, you know, absolutely not. He's not repeating kindergarten. Like, you know, we, you know, need to figure out what's going on because something is going on. And I just feel like I wasn't getting any help through this process. We would do all the things that you told us to do at home, come back to school. Something is not right. So I spoke to the principal. And I said, like, you know, I, I don't want him to repeat kindergarten. The principal said, okay, absolutely not. We'll, um, you know, we'll go on to the first grade and we'll try to ensure that he has a teacher that is able to assist him and yada, yada, yada. So then we get to the first grade, same thing is going on. He um, has a teacher that complains that she um, is needing to take too much time out to help, help him and um, it was a big classroom. So he ended up getting transferred to another classroom and just the whole thing, it was, it was a very, very horrible experience to say the least as a parent and of course as a child as well. 
So we get to the end of um, first grade where he gets the, the second class. And so this is now the fourth transfer to different teachers for my son um, in, in uh, first grade. And at the end, uh, one of the teachers pulled me to the side and she says, have you ever heard of an IEP? I said, no, I've, I've never heard of that. What is that? Then she goes, oh my God. So she literally just took me by the hand and just set everything up for me. And she was like, you need to go to these meetings. This is going to help Jamar. I didn't even know where to go. I didn't know what to do. The principal knew, a lot of the other teachers knew, but this one teacher, I mean, she took me by my hand and led me through the whole process. And ever since then, it was up and up. So mm -hmm. I'm saying that to say, it's like the teachers need to know. So like, why was that, you know, stretched out? Why did we go through all that to finally be told by this one teacher who was a black woman? And um, she like, I could just tell she was really like just shocked at like what had, you know, carried on. So I would like to, you know, see and of course, like, you know, they're kind of just letting you know that where, you know, that disconnect lies mm -hmm. and why as parents and kids um, that are black and brown, not knowing about these services. No, absolutely. And that happens every right. day, every day in every school. Right. And it's infuriating because unless somebody has told you at some point somewhere to ask about this, have you ever heard about this? Have you ever thought about this? A parent wouldn't know about that unless they right. came from a family that had a, a family member with a disability right. or a teaching background, you wouldn't know. And Luckily, with new leadership in the district, I really have much higher hopes, even though I am a little bit <laughs> jaded <laughs> from my experience, but I do feel that we might be headed in the right direction, hopefully, where, te where teachers maybe will stop passing the buck a little bit and being able to recognize that it's okay to do what's called child find from a teacher's perspective. If a child thinks, if a teacher thinks the child might have a disability of some sort, they're allowed to flag it and recommend that they be evaluated. And teachers know that. And that's, to your point, that is the principal's job and the special education teacher's jobs is to educate those teachers on what they're supposed to be doing. Right. And on our end, we are supposed to be able to educate families to let them know these are the things the school's not telling you and these are the places you can go that they're keeping from you and in your experience that's exactly what was happening they were keeping that from you yeah and you know there's no reason if a child has to be switched in kindergarten to a different classroom there's an issue of some sort yeah. and it needs to be identified and evaluated and figured out what it is and then that child, your son, would be able to get services that are appropriate that would then be able to support him so he wouldn't have to be moved from classroom to classroom, which is yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, and it affected him socially. It affected yep. his confidence. He started saying, he, he noticed things. He started saying things. Himself. It was a really, really horrible experience. Thank you. I just wanted to also say to parents that are listening, if you have stories like yours, you know, if there's a story you feel needs to be told, please tell us, email case, let us know. Um, in, honestly, I think you should email Romy also and say, this has happened to me. This is what has been happening because she's, she was new this year also. So she wouldn't necessarily know things that may have happened. But if there are really, you know, I really want these stories to be heard. They deserve to be heard. These kids deserve to have their stories heard and to be told. And so just please, please feel, know that you can reach out and I will always listen. You know, Case will always listen and try and help in whatever way we can.